I'm Larry Jamison. It's really a privilege to be able to interview Greg Semenza. He's a native of New York City. He graduated from Harvard College, magna cum laude. He's uh, an MD-PhD graduate of this medical school. Uh, pediatrics training was at Duke University. Uh, even though I'm a graduate of UNC Chapel Hill, I'm not going to say anything disparaging about that. Postdoctoral training in medical genetics at Johns Hopkins, where he spent his entire faculty career. Uh, he's currently an American Cancer Society research professor and the C. Michael Armstrong professor at Johns Hopkins with appointments, listen carefully, in, in genetic medicine, pediatrics, medicine, oncology, radiation oncology, and biological chemistry, which gives you just a little bit of a sense of the broad reach of his research and, and clinical expertise. And since 2003, uh, the founding director of the vascular uh, program in the Institute for Cell Engineering. Uh, as you might imagine, he's been recognized with a number of awards and elected to a number of important and prestigious academic societies, including the Society for Pediatric Research, the American Society for Clinical Investigation, typically known as, as ASCI, uh, a related organization, the Association of American Physicians, or AAP, the National Academy of, of Medicine, and the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, he's received the, the Gardner uh, International Award, as well as the Korsmeyer Award from ASCI, a very prestigious award, and the Albert Lasker uh, Basic Medical Research Award in 2016, uh, which is really where I would like to start. Uh, You've been recognized in, in many ways, uh, but tell us about how you felt when you heard about the, the Lasker Prize. Yeah, so certainly it was a big surprise because nobody uh, expects to uh, have that kind of uh, honor. Uh, and uh, it uh, was difficult though because the, we weren't allowed to tell anyone. So there was a really long period where um, it was top secret. Um, and that was really hard. Uh, because so, I who, could, so who did you tell? I mean, you told somebody. <laughs> I did. <laughs> um, I obviously I told my family. I told the dean. And I told him by phone. And I could hear him jumping up and down. Um, so he was quite excited, and then a couple of my close friends on the faculty. But really, beyond that, I, I honored the uh, code of silence. Well, most people here will be familiar with the Lasker Award, but just say something about it and uh, its tradition, the people who have received it, and then the actual uh, ceremony itself and what's involved in that. Right, so it, it was started by uh, two philanthropists, uh, Mary and Albert Lasker, and Mary Lab Lasker in particular was a crusader for medical research, and probably her area of greatest concentration was cancer research, and really she played an instrumental role in the founding of the American Cancer Society and in the founding of the NIH for government-sponsored research. Um, and then in addition to that, they set up the, uh, the, uh, the award for the Lasker Prize, uh, which uh, you know, has gone to people who uh, have made really outstanding contributions to biomedical research. Uh, and so it's been a real you know, fantastic honor to be part of that group. The selection committee was filled with Nobel Prize winners. So, you know, again, to uh, get the thumbs up from, from that group was, uh, was a real honor. Um, and and the, the, the award ceremony was just packed with these people. So it was an unbelievable collection of, uh, you know, the um, uh, who's who of uh, science in the US. Well, congratulations. Uh, we're we're super proud of, of your accomplishments, but I also know uh, that they're well-deserved, and you've worked you know, very hard uh, to achieve that recognition, and we're going to spend some time hearing a little bit more about the, the pathway uh, that took you to that, that landmark achievement. Uh, 
And since I'm the dean of the medical school here, I want to begin with uh, why you selected the MD-PhD program here at Penn earlier in your, your career path. Yeah, so I actually had already gotten into an MD-PhD program elsewhere. Um, and the reason I chose Penn was because the medical center was part of a large university. Um, and that really appealed to me to be part of, um, you know, a, uh, a, a university with lots of different schools uh, and, and different interests. Uh, and, you know, it turned out to be a great experience, my, my time here, uh, both the medical education I got and, and the research training. Uh, and I really uh, enjoyed all of it and especially enjoyed uh, uh, my classmates in the medical school who were a really special bunch of people and uh, made for a very entertaining time uh, when we weren't studying. <laughs> so how, how many in this room are from Greg's class? We just see, okay, you've got, <laughs> you've, you've got a fan club and, and maybe after this is over we'll find out you know, how he was as a medical student. Uh, <laughs> we know how he turned out as a scientist. Uh, you know, when you began that MD-PhD training, not, not all medical specialties were created equally in terms of being ripe for scientific advancement. And, you know, various fields seem to mature at different stages. Right now, neuroscience is very hot and uh, a lot of opportunity there, but at that time, hematology uh, was sort of the place to be. And you started working on beta thalassemia. Tell us a little bit about that uh, career choice and, and some of your early work there. What was it like to try to unravel what was going on in thalassemia? Yeah, so I was you know, interested in genetics and at that time there was a genetics graduate group that that's where I got my degree. And uh, Beta thalassemia really was the first disease where people were working out the mechanisms, identifying specific mutations in the beta globin gene, and then showing how that caused the protein to um, function uh, aberrantly and, and cause anemia. So it was really kind of what became a paradigm for understanding different inherited diseases at the molecular level, and that was very appealing to me. Um, and kind of very early on, I kind of felt that that was going to be my niche, that, you know, the translation between the basic science and the clinic, um, that as an MD-PhD, I thought I could make the best contribution, you know, by, by trying to be uh, in that uh, realm between the two. So this will be a little bit off topic, but we, we trained at roughly the same time, and I thought we would have a, a real cure by now for thalassemia and sickle cell anemia and some of these diseases. What, what do you think about the timeline and how far away are we? Yeah, so, uh, you know, this is, the, this is one of the challenges is that, you know, from the, we can understand the, the, the molecular basis in, and do the, the basic research. We can do experiments in mice that look very encouraging and then making that final leap to the clinic, of course, is is the really big one, um, and, uh, and and it doesn't really seem to matter, you know, if it's a new technology or just talking about pharmacologic approaches. It, it's the greatest challenge because um, maybe our models, re it's really hard to recapitulate the human disease in, uh, in an animal model. Um, and it, it's, it's really tough, I think, for the people who the set as their goal to develop the new therapies because unfortunately it's either you succeed or you don't. And in basic research we can do experiments, we may have a hypothesis, it may turn out to be wrong but it doesn't matter, we still learn something about the system we're studying, we can move science forward but in the clinical realm either you succeed or you fail. And, and that's, you know, that's obviously very difficult. Uh, and the people who, you know, can persist and, and continue to try to overcome the obstacles and it seems as though the gene therapy for hematopoietic disorders may be coming very close to fruition now, but yeah, it's, it's taken a long time. Well, we, we all hope that you're right, and perhaps you'll be part of that. Uh, there's a lot of serendipity that happens in science, and I think most people don't realize 
that there can be a, a circuitous path. Uh, at some point, you made a transition from working on hematologic disorders like, like thalassemia and have begun a career path really focused on oxygen sensing by cells and, and tissues. And it's led to some of the most important discoveries in your career, although I guess you could say since beta globin is an oxygen carrier, you've always worked on the same problem. But tell us how you, how you switch fields. How, how did you get involved in the hypoxia-inducible factor field? So I, I was, um, for my PhD here, I worked at uh, Children's Hospital in the hematology division, division studying uh, thalassemia. And one of the main groups at that time that were moving this field forward were Haig Kazazian's lab at Topkins and Stuart Orkin in Boston. They were doing a collaboration. Um, and so I... Uh, you know, I decided to do my postdoctoral training in, in medical genetics at, at Johns Hopkins. And by that time, uh, Haig's group had moved on from studying beta thalassemia to studying um, mutations in the factor VIII gene that cause um, hemophilia A. And so not being very uh, creative, I thought, well, I'll study the factor VIII gene. And I, was, I thought it would be nice to um, study uh, gene expression and uh, use transgenic mice. Um, and so I contacted the, um, the uh, scientist at Genetics Institute in, in Cambridge who had cloned the Factor VIII gene, and he said, well, I can give you the Factor VIII clone, but there's this other gene you might consider called EPO. And um, he had cloned EPO also, and um, this is the hormone that controls red blood cell production, and by cloning it, they were able to make the recombinant protein that could be administered to patients with renal failure um, so that they didn't require uh, uh, transfusions any longer, and it really revolutionized the care of uh, patients with renal failure. Um, but anyway, uh, he had cloned it, and they had told him he had to move on and study factor VIII. So I did some reading, and it seemed like EPO was very interesting because it was expressed in the fetal liver and then the adult kidney, and uh, then there was also the aspect of it being controlled by oxygen. And so I decided that, well, it would be interesting to study the regulation of the EPO gene. Now, nobody at Hopkins was studying this, so it was kind of outrageous for me as a postdoc to say, this is what I'm going to do. And I had gone to John Gearhart, who was uh, the person at Hopkins who was doing uh, the uh, generation of transgenic mice, and I talked to John, and he was willing to help me with this. Um, and so we were actually started making mice that uh, had the human EPO gene, and as a result, they made too many red blood cells because they had human and mouse EPO. Um, and, uh, uh, and so we, we studied the mice and understood what sequences were important in the different tissues, and then we focused on the regulation by oxygen um, and, and that's what led us to um, identify HIF-1 as the transcription factor that was turning on the EPO gene when there wasn't enough oxygen being delivered to the tissue. Well, that sounds like a lucky break. Yeah, uh, I had a plus, lot of lucky breaks. Uh, uh, factor eight would have been a big thing to express, too, so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in a way, in retrospect, you wonder why we didn't think about studying oxygen sensing mechanisms sooner, since all biology on Earth, it seems like, is dependent on oxygen sensing. So were there people working in that field when you got started? Was There were, um, uh, and of course, people had been studying, for example, EPO primarily. You know, that was one of the major ones. The other, of course, were the physiologists who were studying, you know, the control of respiration. Um, and the cardiovascular system by oxygen. Um, so this had been studied for 100 years. The carotid body had been identified as the sensor of the blood oxygen levels and the controlling the response of the uh, heart rate and respiratory rate. Um, but, you know, when we started doing ex experiments, the people in the gene expression field, they didn't understand the significance. But the clinicians immediately understood the significance of what we were doing. So the pulmonologists, the cardiologists, the hematologists, they immediately understood the relevance of this. Um, 
uh, much more so than the, the, the basic scientists who didn't have the, you know, the, the uh, understanding of the biology um, that allowed them to see the, the big picture. So Greg has published, as you might imagine, you know, 400 plus papers and has what's called an H index of 150. Uh, I've, got a, I've got a few of them here. And one thing that I noticed is over the, the decades that you've been working on this problem, you've overcome a number of, of technical challenges and or adopted new technologies to really get past some intractable challenges. So it, it seems like the, a critical clue was to identify which part of the gene was sensing oxygen. And maybe you could say just a little bit about how, how you went about finding those regions and if there were any surprises along the way. Yeah, so it, it gets a little it, it, it technical, but um, suffice it to say that one another famous uh, Penn graduate, Hal Weintraub, who was one of the leaders in understanding gene expression and the way that the genes are organized in chromatin, had shown that when genes, there were important control regions where uh, transcription factors would bind, the DNA would be naked. It wouldn't be covered by protein. And so if you took cells and you just treated them with an enzyme that cleaved DNA very briefly, that the areas that were exposed would be cut. And, and so I did this experiment with some uh, cells from the transgenic mice and identified a sequence that was really open and sensitive. Um, and rather than being in front of the gene, where people usually look for regulatory elements, it was behind the gene. Um, so it wouldn't have been the first place to look, um, but it turned out to be the uh, important uh, regulatory element, because that's where it turned out uh, HIF-1 was binding. Of course, we didn't know that at the time, um, but we were able to take that DNA then and then stick it into a, a gene and put that gene into cells, and now the gene would be turned on if the cells were put into low oxygen conditions. And then we just started chipping away at the sequence, trying to find the smallest piece that would function in this way, um, and then just started making mutations so we could really figure out where the important sequence was, um, and then look for what could be binding to that sequence. Uh, and that's what led us to the discovery of HIF-1, um, was uh, first identifying the sequence it bound to and then using that as a way to fish the protein out. So n not everyone in, in the room is a, is a scientist, uh, but I, I think everyone who's trained at, at Penn will recognize some of the things that Greg is describing. Uh, you know, to be able to form a hypothesis that this region on the back of the gene might be the critical regulator. And then you say, well, if that's true, and I, I put it on to a, another gene, and now that gene is regulated by oxygen, there, there's an epiphany there. And there's a lot of excitement when you get those results back. Uh, but these, these experiments take years. So one of the characteristics required of a successful scientist is to have a pretty long period of time between when you have the idea and when you get that sort of positive reinforcement. Uh, maybe you could just say a little bit about what it's like, your, your scientific side, where you've got these year-long delays, and your clinical side, where you get data back really quickly and know what's going on with someone. Right, and, and also you just get immediate, uh, you know, positive reinforcement, right? You interact with patients, they're grateful for your care. Th that makes you feel good right away. Um, and yeah, in the, clinic, in the clinic, you get that sort of positive reinforcement. Um, in the lab, it's a, sort of the same way, but you make these very small steps. And there are just these little technical hurdles you overcome, and you derive satisfaction from that. But it's really when you write the paper and you see how far you've come that you know it really um, said, wow, we, we've really you know, accomplished something here. Um, and, uh, and that's why that's the, for me, the most enjoyable thing is writing the paper, reporting the results, explaining why we think it's important. 
Now, there's, there's one study in here that I, I really liked reading about. There are many, but one in particular. So once your lab group had identified this critical region of the gene, one of the techniques that you used to find the protein that binds to it and regulates it was, was to use that DNA sequence almost like a, a fishing tool to try to fish out the protein. And it's, it's an elegant method. It's almost like affinity chromatography where you use the DNA sequence as a way to extract the protein from the cell. Uh, that revealed a, a critical part of this, which is that it's not one protein, but two. So you've got, you've got this uh, dimer, this binding. Uh, who came up with that idea? That was a very clever, and, and you might not have found it if you hadn't gone about it that way. Well, actually, at first, we didn't go about that way, and we didn't find it. <laughs> uh, so uh, we had done an experiment, actually, that suggested it was one protein. And based on that experiment, we used a different approach, which involved expressing human proteins in uh, bacteria, in bacteriophage, um, and then using the DNA sequence as a probe and looking for a protein that it would bind to. But this would only work if it was one protein, because each bacteria would only make one human protein. And so we screened millions and millions of clones and got negative results. And so I had to decide what to do next. So one possibility was to continue doing what we were doing. That didn't seem like a very good idea. The other possibility was we could give up and let somebody else do it. That didn't seem like a very good idea. So the third possibility was that we could use a biochemical approach. We could purify the protein based on its ability to bind to the sequence. And that seemed like a really far-fetched approach because we didn't have any expertise in biochemistry at all. Um, but uh, Tom Kelly's lab was across the street, um, and Tom was one of the first people to purify a DNA binding protein. And so his lab was enormously helpful in um, allowing us to uh, perform this purification and, and get just a tiny amount of the protein that we could get some sequence from uh, that would uh, give us uh, some clues to its identity. So, you know, we were very lucky in the sense that um, uh, we, we kind of changed gears, did something that was not necessarily in our, uh, you know, toolbox, but found the people who could help us uh, accomplish it. So there are probably people in the room wondering, why, why is this so important? I mean, obviously, oxygen sensing affects all of biology. Uh, but the more you've worked on this, it seems like every stone that you turn over, there, I mean, there's something really interesting going on from uh, cancer and blood vessel growth and virtually any organ system. So maybe you could just outline what you think some of the key biological pathways are that are regulated by the hypoxia-inducible factor. Right, so the first, and I think the oldest one, is the regulation of metabolism, how cells make energy. Uh, so obviously, if cells have oxygen, then they respire, and they use oxygen in the electron transport chain in the mitochondria, uh, and, and that process allows uh, the generation of a lot of energy. But when oxygen concentrations go, go down, that process doesn't work so well. And rather than the oxygens going all the way, or the electrons going all the way through the chain to oxygen and making water, they, they come off early. And they make something called reactive oxygen species that actually can damage the cell. And, and this is sort of the, the fine point of living with oxygen is you want to use it to make energy, but not to make these um, oxidants that can damage cells. And so what HIF-1 does is it switches cells so that they instead use glycolysis and just convert the glucose to lactate um, as a way to prevent generating all of this ROS. And, and it used to be thought that cells switched beca because they needed to switch to make energy. But we've learned that even under low oxygen conditions, the mitochondria can make energy. It's just that they generate these oxidants that will 
kill the cells, and that's really why they want to switch over. So within every cell, you sort of have this mix between the two types of metabolism that will allow cells to make energy but still keep them safe. And that's what this protein is doing. And even in very simple animals, um, that seems to be like the first function. Then as, the an as animals got bigger, they, so rather than just having it like a worm where the oxygen can go to all the cells by diffusion, you needed special systems to get oxygen to the tissues, meaning the lungs, the blood vessels, the heart, the circulatory system. And, and so HIF-1 plays a role in all of those processes, making the red blood cells, making the blood vessels to um, deliver oxygen to the tissue. So it's involved in balancing both the supply and demand side so that every cell in a healthy animal gets all the oxygen that it needs. Well, could you tell us about diseases where you think abnormalities of HIF-1 are important, both in the pathogenesis, but maybe even targets for therapy? Right, so um, from the delivery side, ischemic cardiovascular disease um, involves this narrowing of the major blood vessels in the heart uh, or in the leg. Um, and that reduces blood flow and in a young, healthy animal, if you reduce the blood flow, you make HIF-1, it stimulates blood vessel growth, it corrects the problem. If you do this in an older animal, HIF-1 is not induced. And the older the animal, the less the response is. So we think that aging, in part, involves a loss of this normal physiological response. And we've shown that if we replace that um, through gene therapy, that we can um, we can uh, correct the defect, uh, and so that this might be a way to um, uh, treat patients who have uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, particularly limb ischemia, where uh, particularly diabetics have um, uh, a risk of uh, limb amputation because of an absence of uh, treatments. So that's where HIF-1 is sort of playing a protective role, and we like to stimulate its, its uh, function, and then on the other side of the coin is where uh, it's playing a role in the disease process, and that occurs in cancer, where cells very rapidly divide. Um, they, they make blood vessels, but the blood vessels that form are not so good, so the, the cells remain very hypoxic, and this seems to be a real driving force for the bad things that happen, invasion and metastasis. And so in, in cancer, we're trying to inhibit HIF-1, um, as a way of uh, uh, more effectively treating some cancers. We've focused on breast cancer, but there are many labs working on uh, many different types of cancer. One of the interesting things that happens in cancer, and we've seen some earlier talks today about this, is often genetic hits at multiple steps along the pathway, uh, almost like uh, fingerprints that you know, give you guidance to the pathophysiology. And one thing that's happened in this field is that the von Hippel-Lindau -Lindo, uh, pathway, VHL, uh, surprisingly to me, at least at the beginning, uh, is tied into the HIF-1 pathway. Can you say something about the, the intersection of genetic predisposition to cancer and, and HIF-1? Yeah, so uh, once we had discovered the protein, the big question was, well, exactly how is it regulated? Why do you have more of the protein in hypoxic cells um, compared to cells that have enough oxygen? And uh, what a number of groups showed was that there's an enzyme that actually inserts oxygen molecules into the protein. And when those oxygen molecules are inserted, this protein that you mentioned, the von Hippel-Lindau protein, VHL, can bind to HIF-1-alpha. And when it does that, it recruits a machinery that modifies the protein and causes it to be destroyed. So under conditions where you have oxygen, the protein gets modified and destroyed. When oxygen levels are low, the oxygen atoms are not inserted into the protein. It's stable and it can rapidly accumulate. Uh, so it's a beautiful system, right, where oxygen is directly regulating the amount of the protein. 
Um, so it's really easy to understand uh, how it works. In patients with uh, kidney cancer, uh, they have mutations in VHL. So now the protein either is not made or can't bind to HIF-1. And as a result, HIF-1 levels are very high even when there's plenty of oxygen around. And as a result, these uh, clear cell kidney cancers have lots of blood vessels um, because they're making lots of, uh, of HIF protein. Uh, and, and that seems to be this sort of defining genetic lesion. Uh, and now there's a drug that's in clinical trials that's targeting HIFs um, uh, as a treatment for a clear cell renal carcinoma. So it'll be interesting to see um, how those uh, trials go. They're quite early on now. Well, that's, that's interesting. I know you, you've been interested in thinking about HIF-1 as a target, including in breast cancer. Uh, could you say something about how that field is evolving? Uh, sounds like there's one drug in clinical trials. I know the cardiac glycosides have been an early hit. Uh, w what do you see in the pharma industry and biotech in, in, that, in that domain? Yeah, so we had done a screen of known drugs to see if any of them blocked HIF activity, and we identified several, including digoxin, um, which of course was used to treat um, heart disease is not used so much now. Um, and um, it turns out that digoxin is a very potent inhibitor of HIF-1, both in, in just cells, but also in animal models. Um, but the drug has a very narrow therapeutic window in patients because it, it can actually cause cardiac arrhythmias, and so it, this is one of the reasons it's not used. Uh, but in mice, they don't have that sensitivity, so you can use much higher levels of the drug. So it works very nice. And of course, what we'd like to do is figure out a way to um, get it to tumor tissue and not to heart tissue uh, as a way of kind of uh, increasing the therapeutic index of the drug. And so we're doing things like trying to use nanoparticles that will selectively be taken up in the tumor tissue and not taken up in the heart as a way to potentially use that drug in patients. So just to move away a little bit from the pathophysiology and, and the treatment applications, which I think are really enormous because the role of, of HIF-1 in metabolism and in cancer and cardiovascular disease, that's, that's very exciting. But I think you also can share with us how have you gone about reinventing yourself uh, throughout your career? Uh, because it, it strikes me that any, any scientist o over decades is going to have these times when they're incredibly successful and then times when they've got challenges or maybe the field sort of has matured and it's time to take a branch point. And we've certainly discussed here among our faculty how do we mentor and redirect people and keep them excited uh, to, to keep reinventing themselves. So I, I would say the first decision point came after we discovered HIF-1 and it looked like it had sort of broad applications. Now, I was trained as a medical geneticist and medical geneticists study for the most part rare inherited diseases. And I made the decision that we would study common diseases, that we might have the greatest impact by studying cardiovascular disease and cancer rather than focusing on any particular genetic disease. So that was already, you know, sort of, um, well, uh, you know, a risky thing to go outside of your field and do work where you're an outsider rather than, you know, doing cancer research, not being an oncologist, doing cardiovascular research, not being a cardiologist. Um, but anyway, that was the, that was the choice uh, I made. Uh, and then somewhere down the road, uh, Hopkins developed a uh, institute for cell engineering that was focused on um, uh, potential cell therapies. And again, John Gerhardt was instrumental in the founding of the institute. Uh, and it seemed to me that any of these cell therapies in order to work would require uh, a blood supply to go along with them. And so I thought a vascular program would be an important, should be an important component of the institute, and I proposed this, and, um, and the university thought it was a good idea, 
And so we started an emphasis on a, a cardiovascular disease and potential um, cell therapies. And so, for example, in this limb ischemia model, we, we, we found that we could have a dramatic response if we combined gene therapy with cell therapy, um, where we took cells from the bone marrow and stimulated them to, uh, to promote uh, blood vessel growth. So that was sort of a second uh, uh, tack where we, we started to doing things that were more uh, cell therapy oriented. Um, and then I guess the third, third uh, uh, act was um, I've kind of decided about five years ago that rather than continuing to, folk, to do both cardiovascular disease and cancer, that I would focus primarily on cancer in my lab and um, really try to move what we had learned to the clinic and, and, and try to develop inhibitors of HIP-1 that could be used for cancer therapy. And so that's where we've been the last five years or so, um, trying to understand both the role of HIF-1 in particularly breast cancer progression and then trying to develop uh, drugs um, that won't be useful just in mice but also in patients. No, that's, that's very helpful. I think there's some really important lessons. You start out as a pediatric geneticist working on rare diseases. The next thing you know, you've discovered a factor that has broad physiologic implications uh, across developmental biology, but from a clinical perspective, maybe most importantly for adult diseases. Uh, and it, it is important to be able to focus your efforts to make some progress. So I'm going to give the audience a couple of minute uh, warning that we're going to have some questions if you'd like to ask some questions. But my last one would uh, deal with our MD-PhD program. So I, I know you, you had lunch with the MSTP students here. Uh, what did you notice about that group? Uh, I noticed that they were just a really fantastic group. They were all working on exciting research uh, projects and uh, really uh, a fantastic group, really uh, sharp uh, students. And, um, and you could tell that they were really uh, committed to um, understanding uh, to try to uh, advance the understanding of the particular area of biomedical research that they were focused on. Well, we hope 25 years from now they all turn out to be as successful as, as you've been. So are there comments or questions? That, sure, please. Is it measurable in spinal fluid? Well. Uh, of course, part of the protein, part of the problem is the protein is normally functioning in the nucleus of cells. So, um, but as you know, a lot of things are being found outside of cells now. Um, and so I think it's a very interesting question. So for example, we know about these small particles that cancer cells release that contain all sorts of things, proteins and RNAs, and they can then be taken up by cells in the tumor that are not cancer cells and make them behave like cancer cells. And normal cells probably, some normal cells probably do this as well. Um, so I'm interested what your, what your uh, reason is for asking me whether it's in the spinal fluid. Welcome to the club. <laughs> Right, and of course it, it has to be in some fluid that you can take when you're talking about the central nervous system, yeah. Um, so to my knowledge, that hasn't been done yet, but I suspect, you know, that either looking at the protein or the RNA, um, if the right techniques are used, that, that it might be possible to, to um, find differences between patients and 
and controls, but, um, and, and there are a number of um, the diseases, in Alzheimer's disease, there's also a vascular hypothesis um, and some evidence um, that uh, a loss of vasculature may be involved in some patients with Alzheimer's disease as well. So uh, I think, and we had done, uh, we had briefly collaborated with a group to study stroke, um, and we showed that if we treated animals with a, a, a chemical that in, increased HIF activity uh, and then subjected them to a stroke, that the tissue damage was decreased. So it, it did seem to have an, a, pre a protective effect in the brain in those, in those studies. So, so can you do that? Well, I'm just going to keep the topics moving around, but it, you, you've teed up an, an important way of, of thinking about uh, is can we use a biomarker kind of approach in different disease states? So another question over here. Well, well, I would say, first of all, that, you know, we only have like 20,000 proteins that are genes for proteins in the body. So those proteins are used very creatively. So probably every protein has more than one function. For most of them, we, don't, we may only know one function so far, but the, you, there are many examples of proteins that turn out to um, be expressed in tissues where it wasn't appreciated, and they may have related roles or completely different roles in, in different tissue. Uh, so we've been interested in, because uh, especially here at Penn, um, one of the leaders in understanding how the immune system can fight cancer, we've been interested in understanding um, how hypoxia within the tumor might block the normal immune response. And so we've shown for example, um, that the innate immune system, uh, one of the ways that um, the uh, macrophages are, pre are prevented from eating other immune cells is that these other immune cells have a signal on their surface that tells the macrophage, don't eat me. And what's been learned is that cancer cells make this protein also. And that prevents the macrophages, the uh, innate immune system from killing the cancer cells. And what we've learned is that, in, in, at least in breast cancer, when the cancer cells are hypoxic, they make HIF-1. HIF-1 increases the production of this protein, and that prevents the cancer cells from being killed by the innate immune system. Um, so we, we think that blocking HIF-1 will help the new uh, immune therapies work better. We've also learned that um, there are things about chemotherapy that are actually um, not, not helpful toward the treatment of the patient. So um, at least in breast cancer, it's believed that there's a small percentage of the cells in the cancer that have the ability to divide an uh, endless number of times. And they give rise to cells that divide really rapidly, but can only do that a certain number of times. And these are called the cancer stem cells. And it turns out if you treat a, uh, either cancer cells in a dish or in an animal with chemotherapy, uh, of course you kill a lot of the cancer cells, but if you look at the cancer cells that remain, it turns out that there's a higher percentage of cancer stem cells than when you started. And of course, that's the worst thing that you could do because we think those are the cells you have to get rid of to eradicate the tumor. And so we, we think that's why tumors may come back after chemotherapy. And what we found is that that increase in the cancer stem cells is actually driven by an increase in HIF-1. If we block HIF-1, then chemotherapy no longer causes that increase. And at least in animals, we can eradicate the tumor. <laughs> 
So we, we think there's an, an, a number of different ways in which if we could inhibit HIF-1, we can make existing treatments and new treatments work better. And that's really our goal. So I think there was a question in the, in the back. So maybe this will be the last, last question. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, there's a little bit of redundancy in that, in addition to a pro So when we uh, name this protein HIF-1, somebody said, oh, why'd you name it HIF-1? Where's HIF-2? Um, well, it turns out, haha, there is a HIF-2. And uh, um, so, and cancers make that too. So there is some redundancy at that level. And so, for example, this drug that's being used to treat renal cancer, and renal cancer, HIF-2 seems to be the really bad player, and this drug only blocks HIF-2. Now, whether that'll be enough in kidney cancer or in other cancers is not really clear yet, um, uh, but that's one level of redundancy. But beyond that, um, one of the, what's really appealing about HIF-1 is it is very high up, right? So it doesn't just control VEGF, one of the angiogenic factors, but a whole series of them. And so if you can block it, you can really block many different responses to hypoxia. And, and so we think that that's appealing. And one of the biases in cancer now is that there's a bias that in order to be important as a target for therapy, it has to be mutated. And we have the opposite view, which is that some things are too important to be mutated. Because when you mutate something, you lock it into one state, on or off. Whereas, um, clearly, in the tumor, we know there are areas with their hypoxia, areas where there's not hypoxia, and HIF-1 has to be turned on and off. A and so we think that really critical factors may not be uh, mutated, but they may still be good targets for therapy. Um, obviously, we're kind of swimming upstream of opinion in that regard, but we intend to persevere. <laughs> well, Greg, I want to thank you so much uh, for joining us. You've had a remarkable career. Uh, you represent everything that we hope will happen with graduates of the medical school and the MSTP program, uh, both to, make, to help us understand physiology better, uh, make important discoveries that potentially have translational implications, and, and you're such a, a rigorous professional. You represent this institution incredibly well. Thanks for joining us today. So for those of you in the room, this is the end of our formal uh, program here at the Jordan Medical Education Center today. Uh, we've got a reception that many of you will attend uh, later this evening, and I hope to see some of you here tomorrow.
right. So, you know, what, another photo that we have is in the front hall, and we're, um, yeah, we are, yeah, we're now the bad guys are helping some people, but, you know, we think that they took their other taxes, again, it's the same thing, right? That some people will not respond to that, but I do that as a sponsor, mm -hmm. once we get there, if we... So, but I wonder, that, um, you know, one of the side effects of the bad guys are photos is um, compliance issues, right? Uh -huh.
Thank you.